Hi everyone, I'm Grandmaster Steven Zirk. And for today's Endgame lecture, I'm going to be talking about pressing in the Endgame. Pressing specifically referring to creating winning chances and winning better, but not winning and not simple Endgames. So far too often, I see players, even pretty strong ones, tend to throw away much better positions like this. You know, they don't take the Endgame seriously. They don't look for the best chances. So in this position, for example, this is a very complicated kind of Rook Endgame, this three versus three the outside passer. It's drawn with perfect play, but it's quite difficult. Actually, Dvoretsky's endgame manual covers it very, very thoroughly, very well. And even some top players have misplayed it. But in any case, it requires a lot of work to draw if, if played correctly. But when I saw a 22, couple 2200s play out this endgame last year, again, they didn't take it seriously. So in the game, Black just rushed this pawn down to B2 which kills a lot of his chances, traded off a bunch of kingside pawns and got nowhere. And the game was agreed drawn shortly after. Actually, white could have been a little better. The reality, the better way to try, you push the pawn to b3 and you threaten to swing the king over. And this creates chances of promoting the pawn or winning the rook in exchange for one or two kingside pawns. White can often draw by creating counterplay on the kingside, but it's very difficult. There's really no risk for black, which is one of the most important parts. And of course, plenty of winning chances. But again, Black played this b4, b3, b2 almost immediately, which I see a lot in endgames. So we're going to talk a bit, basically, about how to avoid that, about how difficult things are for the defender if you play them well. So my first example, I'm going to cover one of the most famous endgame wins, one of these technical endgame grinds. And this example is actually from the 2013 World Championship between Anand and Carlson. So in this game, let's skip a bit. Carlson got a very slightly better end game. And we're going to skip ahead to here. So in this position, a little bit before the end game, Anon played a fairly natural move, queen g4. I can't even really fault it because the potential edge Carlson gets is so small. In this position, after queen g4, black can play bishop takes e3, which forces white to double the pawns. White can't play rook a2, rook a8, and rook e3 because f2 is hanging. So white has to play f takes e3. Again, Anand was perfectly aware of this. I doubt he even considered it a problem. Because oftentimes in these middle games, these doubled e pawns are not a weakness at all. Black will sometimes play bishop e6 and willingly offer white to double his e pawns. But Carlson manages to find, through very cal careful calculated play, some great ways of exploiting this. So perhaps in the future it would be better for white to just play queen e2. And now there's never going to be any doubled pawns, symmetrical structure. Again, you can play on, but the draw should not be too far away. Of course, though, I shouldn't insinuate that white has any kind of serious problem here. Even, this is, even calling this equals plus would be extremely optimistic. So queen e7. Again, queen e6, as they mention, straightforward draw, but not what Carlson's interested in. A lot of times you'll see players, grandmasters, even top grandmasters, agree to draws in positions like this, but there is a lot of untapped potential, especially at the lower levels. So queen e7, c5. And so right now, these e pawns aren't even very weak, right? This black pawn is blocking them. The front pawn, which is usually the weaker one, is well defended. So the first thing Carlson does is push this pawn to c4. So one way or another, this forces the white pawn away from d3, which means this e4 pawn suddenly becomes a potential weakness. Anand correctly plays d4. If he takes, then potentially this b2 and then c3 pawn can also be weak. When he plays d4, he really only has one weak pawn still to, wor to worry about. And right now, Carlson can't do anything about it just yet might look like he can win a pawn by taking on d4. But white simply trades and then wins his pawn back. Check and rook b8. And black has less than nothing here. If anything, white's a little better. So no immediate way to punish. Again, there shouldn't really be a way to punish, but the potential is there. right? Even though this is quote unquote an easy draw and an equal position, white would always take having this f pawn on f2, or this e pawn on f2, if possible. So, it plays rook d1, 
you know, this is what we see in a lot of these end games. I would say safer is d5. And what this does is it closes off this e-file. Black can't play this, which means the e4 pawn is much harder to attack. Black can potentially attack this pawn from the diagonal, but as long as white controls these files, it's very difficult for the rook to get any pressure on white's position. And of course, this one queen attack will be easy for white to defend. But rook d1. But still, Anand's not in any significant trouble as of yet. And that's part of why these endgames are dangerous. Anand is a very strong defender. Even by super GM standards, Anand is a very strong defender. So the fact that even he, he, even he can slip up bit by bit shows you how dangerous these slightly worse endgames can be for just about any player. So rook d1, queen c6. If black, black could take immediately, there's the potential for this after rook takes, d6 is hanging, and if queen c6 or rook e6, white has this rook d5, when suddenly the b5 pawn can be just as weak as the e pawn. So Carlson doesn't take on d4 just yet, and here Anand probably should have taken his last chance to play d5. So queen c6, queen f5, again, he probably didn't consider, consider this position to be any serious danger. Takes. And rook takes, forced to defend the pawn. Rook e5. So we see now that this time, white hasn't gotten the chance to pile up on this fifth rank and on this b5 pawn. So here, again, the d6 pawn is weak, but as we'll see in the game, actually, one weak pawn is better than two weak pawns. So here, Carlson just has the advantage. c7. And now we're going to enter a bit of a maneuvering stage. This is very common in endgames. One very nice thing about better endgames from the attacker's perspective is that there's very little danger. You know, it's not like you know, a, a, pawn, a pawn race, for example, where a small slip can be a disaster, or an attacking race with opposite side cast of the kings. You know, in those cases, one side might be better, even winning, but they're one bad move away from getting crushed. In these endgames, there's very little chance for the defender. And psychologically, that actually means that the defending player is likely to get frustrated, try and force things, and slip. And Anand actually does this here. So here, equals plus is a pretty fair evaluation. You know, black is clearly better, but of course, still a ways from a win. So Carlson improves his position bit by bit, pushes his pawns forward. And here, Anand makes what I would say the first serious slip. So he plays queen g3. He could have simply basically held the position as is. Of course, black has no way of actually winning this e4 pawn right now. Black's goal isn't to try and win the pawn, which is impossible, but to keep the threats on the e4 pawn while also creating other ideas. So he ties white's pieces down to e4, but black's not tied down to e4. At any point, he could switch and try and invade with his rook and queen on the first rank. He could turn on to b2 instead. That's the advantage of a weakness. As long as black attacks e4, White has to defend it, but it's Black's decision when to stop attacking this weak pawn. So, Anand, again, as defenders will often do, tries to force simplification. You know, he doesn't like the idea of defending a position like this for another 40 moves, which is the attacker's prerogative. So, he tries to force complications. Queen g3, and one thing this does is it creates another idea of rook d5. But, Carlson gets his extra pawn now. While he gets the extra pawn, Anand gets a very active rook, which was no doubt his idea. So here, white still has pretty good compensation for the pawn. After rook d5, black is forced into a defensive stance. So this is still, of course, drawn. But Carlson has a clear advantage now, an advantage that won't go away. And he can look to do what he was doing before, which is bit by bit, step up his position, keep creating problems for Anand, who importantly can't really do anything here. You know, unlike an opposite side king's castling, opposite side castling attack position, unlike something like that, white has no active plan here. He can't create any past pawns, he can't create any threats. So Anand just has to sit tight and see what Carlson is going to come up with. And that's why being able to press in these endgames is so important. If you remember that first example, black had a much larger advantage than Carlson has here, but had no idea how to use it and didn't take the time to figure it out. So being able to press in positions like this, of course, even if you don't always win them, it's worth a lot of points. D6. And again, black's rook is stuck to b5. White can always return. 
but black can gradually push his kingside pawns. Here Carlson makes a bit of a slip, plays king f7. This allows Anon to simplify a bit tactically. Carlson should have played h5, when the basic idea is that his rook will ultimately be freed if the rook goes to d5. Carlson transfers his king to d6, and this rook will have no squares left on the fifth rank. So black starts freeing up his position. But of course, white's rook can swing around to g8, among other things. He can try and trade pawns on the king side. Still plenty going on here. But this was the way to go. So king f7, allowing h5. Pawn sacrifice from Anand. And all in all, it improves his chances because even though black's gotten two extra pawns now, they're very bad extra pawns. Of course, black would much rather have a g-pawn here. And they're very hard to make use of. Still very much, we're still very much in the realm of a draw. And of course, there's the nice fact that with this f5 square open, this maneuver, and this h5 square, this maneuver of kicking the rook off the fifth rank isn't here anymore. So f5, black's only real try. Otherwise, he can't make progress without just giving up the b5 pawn. And now he does. Rook e6. So gambiting the pawn, it's forced, but the advantage is, of course, he's got this second pawn that's well placed, and black's kingside pawns are going to press faster than white's going to press his queenside pawns. And so here, I actually like Nakamura's suggestion, just play b3. And even though black can win both these queenside pawns, we get actually an improved version of rook and f and h pawn which is a theoretical draw. If you take away the h6 and g2 pawns, this is a drawn position. And this is actually an improved version of it because it'll take some work for black to even trade off these two pawns. So white could have reached this still difficult but known drawn endgame, and that would have been a safer way to go. But it's possible Anand still didn't think too much of the dangers here. And indeed, he still, of course, shouldn't lose this. And so he gives up the chance for b3. A bit more maneuvering. Carlson's just gradually pressing forward. And here, rook g8. And I'd say a bit of a waste of time. If you play rook c8, it keeps things difficult for black. All right? The rook has to defend the pawn, which makes king f4 more difficult. And you have time to swing the rook around and attack this h6 pawn. Rook g8, on the other hand, since you can't go into the pawn endgame, is really just a waste of time. But Anand's idea probably was that now, after king f4, this c4 pawn is indefensible. So he does win the pawn, but perhaps he underestimated the dangers even here. He's reestablished material equality, but this f pawn is going to very rapidly become a dangerous force. Because white's king is badly placed to deal with it, white's rook is badly placed to deal with it. So we can talk about Anand misjudging how to handle this rook endgame. But the truth of it is, he should never have had to worry about this in the first place. This often comes up in these endgames. Right? Your position's just a tiny bit worse, maybe even equal. But you slip a little bit. Of course, you're not giving anything away. The engine might still very well read 0, 0, 0. But now all of a sudden, you need to find the careful moves. You need to find the difficult defenses. I mean, even this position, again, is a draw. But it's much worse for white than the initial, than the initial position was. So f4 and rook a4. And again, this is actually a game-losing blunder. And the mere fact that a move which is pretty natural, reasonable in this position, you want to get the rook out of the pawn's way, you can swing it back here or up here. The fact that a natural move like this loses the game tells you how critical white's position has gotten. You know, even though it's objectively a draw, it's a, even though objectively it's a drawn position, it's a much worse position than it was before because white has to be so careful. And it turns out that by playing b4, white essentially gets counterplay fast enough. So there's a lot of specifics here. I'm not going to go too in-depth of them. The more general point is that white would have to read all of this correctly and carefully just to earn the draw that he should have had in the first place. But the, the idea is if black tries this rookie one, basically to free up his king so he can push the pawn forward, which is the winning idea in general. White can trade, and because he's advanced this pawn far enough, both sides promote, draw. 
But that's the key. White, that, that line is literally just in time for white. White promotes just in time. So when he loses a tempo, it's too late. So black sacks his H pawn to create this past F pawn. And even though white's up material now, the quality of this F pawn, which is most of the way and well supported by its king, matters much more than the two white pawns here that are much slower. C4. And there's not, nothing works for white at this point. If white goes, tries to trap the king on the F file, then this rookie one maneuver will win because white's too slow. Check. So here white has these checks, which is often a drawing technique in these end games. Actually, this would be much better for white if these two pawns were gone. But after check and king F4, these pawns actually just get in white's way. And if he goes rook A1, trying to stop the pawn now that the king's up here, black wins tactically. Rook E6, threatening rook E1 to promote. And after king G2, rook E1, white crucially has no check on the side. No, king F4, rook A8. Going for a last tactic, if black wonders and promotes, white's got this skewer on f8. But rook g1, and the pawn is going through. If rook checks, king e3, and there's nothing white can do. Further checks, black can just take these pawns, or even hide behind them, and then promote his own pawn. So here are non-resigned. So what's the lesson from this? Again, the game losing move, and the move that gets the question mark in the books, is rook a4. Right? Because with b4, white had a draw, but with rook a4, white lost. But the seeds of defeat were sown way before this. White should never have had to decide whether to play b4 or rook a4. Again, both look pretty reasonable in this position. Should never have had to calculate this whole line up to b6, you know, this nine move variation just to draw. None of that should ever have been required of white in the first place. And if white had avoided these slips before, so going back, I would say the biggest one, just this queen g3, giving black this endgame in the first place. There's a couple others. Even though it's still drawn, it's difficult. And everyone makes mistakes in difficult positions sometimes. And conversely, looking from the attacker's perspective, being able to create those kind of problems is so valuable. Because so often, I mean, Anand, again, who is a world-class defender, even by super GM standards, can slip in an endgame like this which means just about everyone else can too. So the key is the attacker. So really thinks things through. First of all, look at moves that create problems for your opponent. Of course, the position is drawn. You know, Carlson knew that. He didn't think this was winning, but he's creating threats that Anand has to figure out how to accurately deal with. And he really has nothing to lose. There's very little play for white in this position. He just has to make sure not to blunder this b5 pawn or let white create threats against it. But of course, Everything is on Carlson's side, psychologically. All right, so to continue from that, I'm going to show one of my own games. I've had a few successes in similar endgames just like this. This one is particularly important because I actually played it last year in a GM Norm event in Charlotte. And as it turns out, I just made the cut for my final GM Norm and ultimately the title. So this win, of course, proved very crucial. So. In this position, I was playing black. Black has a tiny advantage due to the isolated pawn. If white takes with the F pawn, then the king side's a little weak. Neither one, of course, should objectively be a serious problem for white. And when there's, this, when there's only one piece like this, black has no good way of really applying pressure to this D pawn. So the fact that it's weak means very little. It just means that white's queen is on defensive duty, which again, is nice for black, but Black has no plausible try to actually win it. It just means his position's a bit more comfortable. And equals plus would again be a pretty optimistic evaluation here. Queen c6. But as we're going to see, what tends to happen in these positions, and again in equal positions, a lot of players, even strong ones, and Kalik Stein is a strong I am, even strong ones will tend to play slowly. You know, they won't respect the danger of the position. They won't, they'll just kind of sit there and let you press a bit and a bit more. And the reality is they should be playing active. So he did, to his credit, he did start with a good active move. He played queen c3. Not a trivial move because this pawn endgame, after queen takes c3, requires some calculation. So it does take some work to play a move like this, but it's very good that he worked it out. Worked out correctly that the pawn endgame is drawn. And 
basically went for as much as he could from the position. You know, white could simply play a move like queen d2 and just sit on defensive duty. And of course, queen d2 isn't losing. It's not even a real serious blunder. The computer won't give it any kind of issue at all because white's still in that threshold of a draw. But the reality is white's position is slipping up bit by bit when you play a move like that. And a lot of players will do that. I've won a few games off of it. And it's worth figuring out how to create play when your opponent does something like that. So queen d6, you know, just to look at this a bit, the gist of it is white's king gets active just in time. Even though black takes up a slightly better post, black gets to d5, but after c4 check, and basically black has no way to break through. He can play b5, but white's king holds him off on both sides. Black goes to a4, white covers on b2, and there's no way for black to get through into white's position. Again, took some calculation, but actually doing that and putting an effort into endgames, which a lot of players don't do, is very important. Because now white does have the C file, which helps out a bit. Queen C8 check. I actually don't like this as much. It looks a bit active, but everything in black's position is secure. And since black can take D4 with no repercussions, that white's queen is just going to have to go back and defend. So this won't achieve anything. White's basically just improving black's king with tempo. It's chasing black's king forward where it wants to go anyway. And then it's going to return back over here to defend this pawn. So better, I, what I would like better is something like, say, g4. And now if black wants to make any play, press forward on the king side, for example, he's forced to trade another pair of pawns, which makes the defensive task that much easier. Again, not a serious blunder or anything. The computer, like I said, will not complain about it at all. But it just means that the margins are a bit narrower than they were before. King f7, queen b7 check, king g6. And yeah, black's king, again, a little happier than it was before. Queen check, f5, king f7. And so now, here it's a bit trickier. White doesn't really have g4 anymore. And f4, with the same idea of restricting black's pawns, creates some weaknesses in the position. Again, it, and it also creates this potential invasion route for black's king, which means that pawn endgames are a lot riskier. So queen c3, and now bit by bit, black starts to create advantages in the position. g5, a4. So white's stabling his queen side, which is fine. King e7. I would say that in general, you want to be looking at ways to improve your position. It's too late to improve the, the king side pawns. Improving the queen side pawns is fairly useful. I would have centralized the king a bit earlier. e2 and f4. I mean, this isn't a great winning attempt. There isn't a great winning attempt here because black's advantage is still quite small. But black does need to find a way to move forward here. Right, sooner or later, everything in white's position is well defended. You're not going to create any pass pawns or force any wins off the bat. So you need to look for a way to create complications and any kind of advantage you can. And it's still not even equals plus yet. But after f4, we do get one nice thing. If white takes, now these two outside pawns mean that black has the possibility of creating a passed h pawn. Right? If this pawn were on f5, black would have a much harder time creating winning chances. In fact, in this position, again, I think this is the time now, before things are critical, for white to calculate and come up with more aggressive, more optimistic, more greedy moves. So queen d3 here, for example. And then white's creating strong counterplay. This is the downside of f4. Now this diagonal is open. And importantly, now black has problems to solve too. Black has to be a little careful because white can win some pawns. Black has to make sure you know, he doesn't lose pawns and suddenly become worse. Black might blunder there. So psychologically, that's also very useful. If we, you play moves like this, your opponents have to worry. And in better positions, better end games, they often don't. For example, after g takes, queen takes, with these more passed pawns and this weak pawn on d4, black has nothing to worry about here. His only question is, how good of a winning chance can I create? Or conversely, after queen d3, black has to watch out that he doesn't suddenly give white something on the king side. So g takes, queen takes, a bit passive. The problem is, Black's careful not to give white any checks, 
and white can't go after this b6 pawn because d4 will cover b6. f3, and this is, makes sense. The idea of f3 is now black can't create a pass pawn on h3. If he plays g4, white will just capture. So I think the best move here, the, the one downside is now all of a sudden this pawn on g2 is a bit weaker, and black aims to punish that. So h4, queen b5, right, with the idea of now if queen takes d4, since there's no f5 pawn, white can take this pawn with check. And suddenly white's down a weak pawn. White can offer a queen trade here because the pawn in game is fine. So instead of that, black plays queen g3. And I actually don't like that white allowed this. The problem now with f3, white doesn't have a great way to defend g2. If king f1, h3. So taking here loses both pawns. Actually, it's even worse if black goes here. If white goes here, black checks. And whichever way white goes, black can capture one of these pawns with check. And then it will be a winning endgame. So here, we're starting to see that white does have some problems to solve after queen g3. Because suddenly his king side is weakened. So actually going back, after h4, again, white should have played queen d3 with the idea that after queen g3, king f1, h3 doesn't work anymore because f3 is defended. You know, this queen, I would say, is very well placed on d3. It covers all the weak pawns, and it has potential counterplay on h7. After queen b5, which the idea is nice, right? White wants to create counterplay on black's king side. The problem is it's just much too slow. Because black's had all this time to advance his pawns, during which white hasn't achieved nearly as much, black's threats are going to come in first. This h4 pawn is a much stronger threat than any of white's pawns. It's three moves from queening, and only one pawn stand, stands in its way. So queen b5, it's the right idea, but it's too late. Now after queen g3, now white is in some serious trouble. King f1 again fails to h3, when white's going to be down a pawn at least. Of course, the attempt to defend by queen e2 is a disaster after h2. So it's too late at this point for white to defend the position. He'll lose a pawn if he tries. So he has to go for this counterplay. But again, as I said, since black's the one who's been improving more before, Black's play comes in first, which, especially in endgames, whoever has the better passed pawn, as we saw in the Carlson game as well, whoever has the better passed pawn tends to win because the threat of creating a queen is so dominant in the endgame. It's far stronger than anything else. So queen g1 check. Here, I play a bit of cat and mouse, just gradually deciding where to place my queen. I'd say this is a good psychological trick in endgames. If your opponent can't really do much in response, you just bait them around a bit. You make them take some time, get a bit nervous about blundering. This works with queens because the queen can just maneuver around the king so effectively. A lot of times, if they're passive in rook or minor piece endgames, you can just kind of shuffle between threats. Even if none of them are winning, you know, you just make, it's much more likely that they'll make a mistake than you will. And same idea. The queen just shuffles around. In the end, I settle on this square on f4, where it's well centralized and start to push my pawn. And you can see just how dangerous this pawn already is. Right? It's two steps from queening. It's actually hard to stop for the king because the queen against the king is so powerful. If the king can't stop a queen and pawn, it'll actually get mated if it tries. So here, white already needs to find an immediate tactical solution. And so the main defensive idea in queen endgames is perpetual check. Now, the king side pawn advance did weaken black's king. So there is a plausible threat of perpetual check here. And that's what white should seek. And so here, much like the critical rook a4 versus b4 position in a non-Carlson, here was actually white's critical moment. So we can talk about how white blundered here instead of finding the unique defense. But I think the much more interesting blunders were the earlier ones. These queen checks that gave black time to start pushing his pawns, the lack of playing g4 to restrict black's kingside advance, the earlier failing to play queen d3, which would have stopped this whole queen g3 maneuver. All of those I consider much more important blunders. Because there is a tactical solution here, but it's quite difficult to find. And it very well might not be there at all. You want, to, you want to stop things way before these concerns come up. And here, the unique draw for white was queen b7 check. 
when black's king doesn't have any great ways to go. So for example, king f6 is the best try, but the key here is after queen c8, again, there's really no shelter. If h2, white has a perpetual check. If king g7, not queen e6, which allows this pawn to advance forward, but queen d7 check is the key. Black can't trade queens. Even though this pawn is advanced, white's king will be in time to stop it, which means that black really has nothing good here. Because this queen is on d7, it's threatening to take on e6. If king f6, queen d8 just maintains the checks. And otherwise, black has no moves. So if white were to play queen c8, or in this position, I'd find something else, because the black is too slow to advance the pawn. Yeah, and it's drawn, but same thing, the nice side of a better endgame, you can keep pressing. So instead, white plays queen a7 check. And again, the fact that this is the difference between a drawn position and a lost one tells you how much white position, the white position has declined. So king f6. The key here being, if white goes for the same kind of perpetual after queen a8, he's still threatening the draw with checks here. So black plays king g7, but crucially, white doesn't have queen d7 check. He has queen b7 check, after which black simply plays king h6, and there's no queen e6, and, there, and no perpetual. So white can fight on, white can try and create threats, but this is lost. So instead, he takes on a5. Again, the same idea, largely, of going for counterplay. The problem is, this h-pawn is much better than the two white queenside pawns. Similar to the Anon Carlson game again, quality of pass pawns means so much in these endgames, especially queen endgames. So white is threatening queen d8 check. Black goes here. There's some problems here. If king g7, queen e7 check. And it's still difficult to stop the checks. So black first improves his queen under d4. It's not about winning the pawn. Winning the pawn is irrelevant here. Black's whole goal is to promote this pawn, for which you know he would gladly give up both of these pawns and give white the d4 pawn back. It's not about the pawn. It's about improving the position of the queen. And from this d4 square, the queen stops all kinds of checks. It's prepared to give some nasty checks to the white king, and it covers a lot of other important squares. So queen a8, again, White's trying to create counterplay. The pawns aren't important. The threats of perpetual and the threats of this skewer mean much more. And here, white's already lost, but I actually slipped. This endgame is still difficult for both sides. With the queens on, it's very tactical and very sharp. A lot of it depends on carefully avoiding perpetual check ideas. And so the way to win was to do something we saw a bit earlier. King g7, queen b7 check. Again, no queen d7, no threat on e6 king h6. And if you check, white has no perpetual because of this key idea. And this is actually a nice feature. The white king is badly placed on e2. So white can't take this h2 pawn thanks to this skewer. And we'll see that come up again later in the game. After queen check, queen f6, the checks will run out very soon. So that was the key. This queen is already very well placed. This is another time when I tried to play cat and mouse. You know, just shuffle around a bit. I figured I could always change my queen's position by checking the king, which is common in these endgames. But the mistake here is that this idea of toying with your opponent, trying to create practical threats, it doesn't make sense when you're already winning. Right? Black can promote the pawn here. Black can push it through. So there's no reason to try and trick white or create difficulties. Just win the game. So queen b2, king e1. I mean, it's still not easy. It's very difficult for white to defend, but objectively, white did have a defense. And here, after queen c2 check, white had this very nice idea of king f1. So the idea is, first of all, if black carelessly checks, for example, if black goes here, white can start to approach the pawn, or black can just sit on the f-file. Right, of course, here, white's not going to go here and wander into a tragic checkmate. White's just going to sit here. And the key point of this king here is that the king can stop this black pawn. So for example, if in this position, after h2, white has a perpetual. I mean, a difficult one, but a perpetual, because any queen trade is actually bad for black. Black will lose the pawn endgame. Yeah, so there is a small advantage to having these pawns. 
Wherever black goes, if white can check on c4, for example, or e4, as long as white retains the move at the end, white will play king g2, win this pawn, and the game. So here, the best move is actually king f1. Again, still difficult, but it shouldn't have, the opportunity shouldn't have been allowed. Instead, white played king e3. Looks a bit better, the king stays active, but it's not as good. The problem is black's queen gets to activate itself again and find the best square. Check. Bit more cat and mouse. Now with the queen on c2, I decide to play king g7. And one nice feature of this c2 queen is that it stops a lot of diagonal checks. Among other things, it can also check from a lot of squares and maneuver to wherever I need to be to cover things defensively. So check, g6, queen a8. And there's still practical difficulties here. Right? There's all kinds of possibilities, perpetual check or maybe skewers on the h file. But objectively, black should be winning. Check. So I check all the way to b6 to cover these seventh rank checks and play king g7. Queen e8 and h2. Oh, another nice feature of this, this is where you just have to calculate. Again, the nice feature of having the pawn here on h2 is white can't capture it. If white plays queen takes h2, black will win with queen b2 check. So white checks a bit, and we have to be careful. Before you play h2, of course, you need to calculate that the king does in fact escape the checks. It's crucial that the queen also defends the c6 pawn, and black's king basically slips out through the center bit by bit. Queen f8 check. If queen h8, king f5. There is one try to watch out for. Queen h8, f5, queen h3. You know, you have to watch out. Not king e5, and queen takes h2 check, which would be a disaster, but king g6. White's out of checks, and he still can't take on h2. Of course, you have to calculate all this in advance, but after this, the king goes to d5, and white's actually out of checks again, thanks to this nice queen position. And again, there's not much for white to do here. White plays king f1, but after check, white can't play king g2 to stop the promotion, because queen g1 just forces the king away with mate. So king f2 is forced. And here, black has to make one last check. Of course, it's tempting to promote the pawn, but even with two queens, if there's a perpetual check, there's nothing doing. So you can calculate a lot of variations here, but a simpler way to realize the win, and what I thought of is, the king can march to this a1 square, and wherever white checks from with the black king on a1, black can either block with queen b2 check or queen a2 check. So there's nothing white can do. When, wherever his queen is on the board, with black king on a1, white is lost. And it doesn't take much to realize that white's queen does, has no way of stopping this king march. It just doesn't have enough squares. So black promotes, and after one check, here again, white could give a few more checks, but the king's just going to run over here, and there's nothing white can do. So here white resigned. All right, so let's look at back at that again, briefly. So we can talk about, there's a couple tactical mistakes, actually. This queen a7, and again, a lot of times, if you look in a book, you know, read some annotations, it'll say, oh, queen a7 was the losing move. And it's true. Queen a7 was the move that crossed the line from a draw to a loss. But we've been inching closer and closer to that line over the last 15 moves. And that's really what matters. White should never have had to decide between queen a7 and queen b7. And that's why it's so important as a defender to get as much as you can to defend accurately and play carefully right from the start. Yeah, and if white had played, if white had played here, for example, g4, black's kingside pawn offensive would have been stunted, and it would have been much harder to create winning chances. So that's really the way to defend these endgames, well, and the way to, to press in them. You want to take as much as you can. Of course, you have to be careful. You, know, you have to make sure you don't blunder a pawn to some sequence of queen checks. You have to be careful, but beyond that, you should Go for as much as you can. Try to create as many problems as you can. Black tried to create this pass pawn on the h file, which again, should, was defensible, but ultimately proved successful. It created practical chances. You know, playing king f7, king g8, or offering a draw, 
all three of those things, play, doing that or pushing the kingside pawns, both objectively are drawn. But one of them makes your opponent solve problems. And this again, this is what Carlson is an absolute master of. The fact that he did it to someone of a non-strength is insane. You know, a lot of, even super GMs have agreed to draws in positions like that. And that's the key idea, is there's a lot of points to be made in endgames like this. But you have to put some work into it. And all too often I see, like in that first example, you know, I'll see players just playing the most automatic moves. They won't take time in endgames. They'll take it for granted that they're draws unless there's some crushing advantage. And they won't really know how to handle them. So there's a lot of good examples out there. Carlson's got another famous win against Rajabov and a couple others. But the key is, you know, create practical threats, see how much you can take, and really make your opponents solve problems and calculate variations. And conversely, if you're on the defense, you want to take as much as you can. You want to set up as strong a position as you can before your opponent does this to you. Again, something like g4. You know, g4 draws, queen c8 draws, but one of them eases the, def the future defensive task by quite a bit. And that's what you want to look for. Again, these aren't moves the engine will say is winning, but they're moves that will win you games. And yeah, that's all I have. Thank you very much.